It's been a full five years since Breath of the Wild was released and we're still entranced. Nintendo packs so many innovative ideas and small details into its open world opus that new discoveries continue to be made almost every day. But how did the development team decide what Breath of the Wild should be like as an experience? Where did they draw their inspiration from? And how different could it have been? In this video, we're going all the way back to the game's development to revisit 19 fascinating facts that helped shape this landmark game. Be sure to let us know in the comments how many of these you knew already. The goal of Breath of the Wild was to break the conventions of the Zelda series, and that was really taken to heart by the development team, who pitched all sorts of wild ideas early on in planning, from a Hyrule with invading UFOs that could abduct cattle, through to a thoroughly modern-ish Link. The team clearly had fun imagining new possibilities for the series, and for Link alone almost a hundred different designs were presented within the team. And hey, as goofy as he may look, the concepts for Biker Link weren't too far off the mark in the end. And that's thanks, incidentally, to series producer Eiji Aonuma, who was the driving force behind the inclusion of the Master Cycle Zero in the game. In the must-read book, Creating a Champion, he says he pitched the idea early on, but was rebuffed, only to bring it up again later as the ideal reward for players who complete the Champion's Ballad DLC. The staff were pretty unenthusiastic, according to Aonuma, but eventually got into the idea. I guess Zelda's Don made them an offer they couldn't refuse. Which would be a motorbike in Breath of the Wild. Honestly, that's just a really fun idea. I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make it. This is the greatest thrill of my life. Ah! <laughs> Link may be in blue instead of green, but this early prototype sure does look familiar to long-term Zelda fans. It was actually created early on in the development of Breath of the Wild to test interactions between different systems. And it's not hard to see how the gameplay on display here helped establish a foundation for the full game. Another thing of note, this 2D prototype wasn't actually 2D at all. The not really 2D test build gave Nintendo's designers confidence that they were onto something, and in fact, the interconnectivity between different systems became the core technological focus for Breath of the Wild. The philosophy was that by building connections between everything in the world, the gameplay possibilities would multiply. To realise this multiplicative gameplay concept, the team implemented a robust physics and chemistry engine and really focused on making the interactions as intuitive as possible. The result was unprecedented opportunities for player agency and lateral thinking. It's worth diving a little deeper into something I just mentioned, the game's chemistry engine. After all, in gaming we hear a lot about physics engines, which are concerned with movement. But Breath of the Wild's team also formalised the idea of a chemistry engine, which is concerned with states. And this really is one of the game's key underlying components. It's called a chemistry engine, but it's actually less about chemistry and more about elements. Fire, water, ice, wind, electricity, and how they interact with both objects and one another. The idea of calling it a chemistry engine actually makes a lot of sense when you consider that the development team described the multiplicative gameplay they were trying to create as chemical reaction play. Breath of the Wild's gameplay design drastically increased the possibilities for players and ensured they could approach challenges in countless different ways. But how to make it work visually? It was the art team's job to come up with an art style that would allow the game to deftly balance realism and playability. And their starting point was actually quite surprising. It was Wind Waker, and specifically how elegantly that game was able to transition to higher resolutions, as seen in Wind Waker HD, without losing the originality of its presentation and the fun of its gameplay. Wind Waker HD's visual design was thus the starting point for Breath of the Wild, but it soon became clear that those visuals were too stylized for a game that relied on believable physics and chemistry, for people to make connections based on things they could do in the real world. They needed information-dense art and a certain level of realism, and thus the art style shifted to incorporate that. 
The end result is detailed and realistic where it needs to be, and stylized and comical everywhere else. Ugh. No game is made in a vacuum, and Nintendo's designers found inspiration in a number of other games when setting out to create Breath of the Wild. Game director Hidemaru Fujibayashi, for instance, told Edge magazine that he was inspired by both Minecraft and Terraria, citing the sense of adventure, exploration, and how it inspired curiosity. <laughs> it's not hard to see more direct parallels, too. Producer Eiji Aonuma, meanwhile, mentioned in interviews that he had played a number of open world titles, The Witcher, Far Cry, and Skyrim, but insisted it was to more broadly understand the development task they were facing. Many of the goals for Breath of the Wild, he said, were actually born out of Skyward Sword, specifically expanding on that game's stamina gauge and restricted climbing mechanic, as well as giving players the chance to explore between the different areas. And we got a sense of that all the way back in 2014. This is a clean break from the conventions of past games in the Zelda series, where you had to follow a set path and play through the scenario in the right order. Nintendo concepted a wide variety of looks for Breath of the Wild's Sheikah civilization, but in the end settled on the Jomon period in Japanese history as the main source of inspiration. This ran from around 14,000 BCE to around 300 BCE, and it's not hard to see how Jomon pottery designs like these influence the look of the shrine entrances, towers, and other ancient Sheikah technology. The team explored how to portray the Divine Beasts, known originally as the Four Great Relics, extensively during development. The focus was always on making each clearly identifiable as an animal from a distance, but one fused with factories, palaces, and other constructed elements. It was actually the initial design for Varna Boris that helped solidify the direction for the three other Divine Beasts, and the process of refining it sounds fascinating. Art director Satoru Takazawa says in Creating a Champion, for instance, that the walking animation for Varna Boris was modelled as though the camel was a costume with people in the front and back like a lion dance. Wildlife artist Ayashida, meanwhile, says it was designed as though it were a camel, but drawn by someone who has never actually seen a camel. This helped make it feel ancient and unsettling, yet also lovable. The Divine Beasts weren't the only denizens of Breath of the Wild inspired by real-life animals. See if you can guess the character based on the creature. One of the most fascinating aspects of Breath of the Wild's development is imagining how radically different the game could have been. I mean, check out these surreal Guardian concepts. And even once the final Guardian look had been settled on, in some parallel universe there's a version of Breath of the Wild where giant, fortress-like Guardians with multiple beam cannons dot the landscape. Lead artist for enemies, Takafumi Kiyuchi, reveals that these were designed, but unable to be implemented. Staying on the game's Guardians, did you know the Guardian Stalkers were actually inspired by the Octorox from the original Zelda? When I played the first Legend of Zelda game, Eiji Aonuma explains in an official making of video, I felt like the Octorok were pretty huge. They'd make all these complicated movements and I really didn't like those guys. So we thought about creating an enemy using that image and that's how we came up with the Guardians. Of course, he didn't think they'd be shooting lasers, but in video games, most things are made better by adding lasers. Ancient tech researcher Robbie was always a mad scientist, but according to NPC artist Yuko Miyakawa, his other starting point was that he would embody the spirit of rock and roll. Robbie, after all, was well outside normal society doing really out there research. Complementing this concept, Pura's original theme was punk rock girl. Both changed significantly, but in different ways. For Robbie, it was his clothes, which became more Japanese and more in sync with the finished design for the Sheikah relics. He was finalised first, hence Pura's similar look. It was actually her personality that completely shifted, going from languid and lacking energy to bubbly and excitable. Melania is one of the stranger creatures players come upon as they journey across Hyrule, but this horse god's design was originally much more in line with the other fairies. That seems like an awkward fit, however, given Melania serves an entirely different purpose. 
The change to a leering, creepy, disembodied spirit allowed Nintendo to give Melania a personality all its own. You can also see echoes of Melania at the stables all over Hyrule. Staying on horses, they're pretty multifaceted in the final game, but the team had plenty of concepts for what horses could potentially do that didn't make the cut. Ah well, at least they got the music one in. That is a Sheikah Slate. The team's rough concept for the Sheikah Slate, or Conductor as was its placeholder name, gave it more of a mechanical bent. For one, the device was pulled apart, twisted, then put back together to turn it on and off. Secondly, it had some kind of injector for liquid ancient energy. And perhaps wildest of all, it had a mechanical dragonfly spy, a drone basically, embedded within it. One physical element that did stick is the idea that Link pulls an actual pin to generate remote bombs. See? That's the pin. It's also worth pointing out that the Sheikah Slate evolved right up until release. Check out this footage from E3 2016. Yes, that's the Sheikah Slate being used to scout out enemy HP, basically tagging them like Far Cry and many other open world games. That feature may have been cut, but being able to see enemy HP, albeit only from close range, still made its way into the game via the champion's tunic. <laughs> Speaking of enemies, I love the story behind this iconic sound effect. It was made using an actual horn that one of the programmers brought in from home. Programmers, assemble! This last point is particularly crazy, given just how large and just how dense Breath of the Wild's Hyrule already is. Consider this. The team also wanted to include tiny towns populated by tiny people, and Link would be able to shrink himself down and visit them Minish Cap style. This worlds within worlds concept certainly looks cute, but I think we can safely say, five years on, that Breath of the Wild had enough content to keep us occupied without it. Would you like to see tiny towns in a future Zelda? Don't, don't! No, the village! And what features are at the top of your most wanted list for Breath of the Wild's sequel? Let us know in the comments. And in the interim, be sure to get a copy of Creating a Champion. It's a fantastic insight into the making of Breath of the Wild, as is the GDC presentation from 2017. And lastly, why not check out 150 tiny things that make Breath of the Wild a game for the ages. And for everything else, you're in the right place. IGN. <laughs>